good afternoon. Welcome to another edition of FinWeek Money Matters, the show that helps you manage your finances. I'm Samantha Loring and uh, my co-host Mark Ashton, editor of FinWeek. Welcome to you, Mark. Looking forward to the show this afternoon. On the show, we're looking at what steps you should take that in order to build up your property portfolio and eventually become hopefully a property mogul. In our investment segment, we're discussing BE shares, which ones are offering value at the moment, which ones potentially you should uh, stay away from. From. And later on in the show, diversity in the C-suite, uh, we talk transformation at the executive level. If you have any comments for us, so uh, you can send them through to our email address. We'll give that to you shortly. But of course, remember to read uh, these stories and many more in this week's edition of FinWeek, which is on shelves from today. The magazine also digitally available in English and Afrikaans via mysubs.co.za. And as I said, any comments for us to Money Matters at abn 360com Come. Well, the property millionaires and billionaires of South Africa are typically the unassuming type, quietly making their fortunes in an industry that is still the best performing despite market volatility. So could investing in the property sector be your key to financial freedom? In its cover story this week, FinWeek looks at how you can become a property mogul. Joining us now, we've got Keelan and Glovu, Head of Property Funds at Standard. Jonathan Davies, Joint Area Manager for Pam Golding Properties Hyde Park Office. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, so, Mark, I'll just start off with you. I mean, who doesn't want to become a property mogul, of course, but there are various ways that you can look at doing it. Sure. So, basically, I kicked off the story taking a look at those two different strategies. So, as I was growing up, my dad always told me the amount that he needed to retire was 7 million rand. And obviously, he now gets into his late 50s, early 60s. He's hopefully made it, made it that far. And then I, I met a mate about three or four weeks ago, and he was basically talking to me about how at 33, he's managed to acquire 7 million rands worth of property. And obviously, what he's done there, he's been able to gear himself up. He's got six properties plus his primary residence, and he's able to rent these out and obviously generate an income. Um, but one of the things that's interesting about that is he's taken, used obviously other people's money to gear himself to get to that point. He is, however, dependent on the rental income coming in, interest mm -hmm. rates staying where they are, and of course the um, his salary to be able to maintain his cash flow. So it, it's one of these interesting trade-offs in strategy. And, and for the last 10 years, or maybe even 15 years, you could argue, it's been a very easy situation for residential property. You've been able to make a lot of money quite quickly. Things change over 2008, 2009. Banks started changing lending criteria. You don't get 110% bonds anymore. Mm -hmm. um, the ability, the, the actual growth in terms of property prices, either residential or commercial, are far more muted than they have been. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I argue that maybe one of the better ways to get into property is to use something like listed property and, and take advantage of the consistent dividend yields there and sort of build up your portfolio because I think that it's big, the entry, the barriers to entry for getting into property have become quite high for your average 30 year old. So there we go, that's the case that you're making today. Mm -hmm. So we'll argue which is the best uh, way to do it. But Keelan, you're coming in from of course the listed property sure. perspective today. Total returns last year, 35.6% relative to uh, equities at 26.7%. And then you've got this year a little bit more muted uh, so far at, to the end of June, almost 9% return. So what's driving listed property right now what would you say the key themes driving returns in the space so the key thing is um, income uh, growing income streams on average we're looking at uh, the listed companies uh, growing their income by about uh, seven percent it's a lot lower than the good times of 2007 2008 but seven percent is still a fairly decent number mm -hmm. and the income is fairly uh, predictable there's no probably other asset class uh, that can give you a stable and uh, growing mm -hmm. income so property is all about income, capital is a bonus, comes over time. How predictable is the income? And I always find it fascinating to go through the listed property uh, financial reports and they kind of break the tenants down into the A, B and C category right. and then obviously when, the, when these guys are, ex when their various contracts are expiring. I mean, how predictable, have we, have we had instances where what you thought was predictable income actually doesn't materialize? I mean, can you think of examples in recent years? N not really, because see, uh, most of the lists are logged in for three to four mm. years and they escalate, you've got annual escalations on average of about 8%. Uh, percent. Mm. So 80% of the list is locked in for three, four years. So the risk only lies with the 20%. 
And out of that 20%, yes, you might find one or two or three big leases coming in at lower rents, mm. but on average, you're still getting a nice, uh, decent uh, growth. Mm. When you're looking at a listed property uh, company right now, is are you predominantly looking at sectors first and then you go into all other issues in mm. terms of exposure? I mean, how important is it to know whether it's residential, commercial, office uh, mm -hmm. space? No, it's quite important. Uh, there's di different cycles at this stage. And, and what cycle are we in at the moment in those various uh, sectors? We, we like the industrial sector. We believe it's uh, stronger than uh, most other sectors. Vacancies are lower, around about 4.4%. And our second best sector will be the retail sector. But then you have to be careful at retail. So it's mostly dominant and big shopping centres. And with the face of actually competition coming through, there's lots of developments coming up. Mm. So you have to be in the most defensive centres. Whereas the office market is uh, our least favorite, uh, lots of vacancies. Vacancies mm -hmm. are increasing, they're around about 11% at this stage. But then we've got new developments coming through. If you look right around here, there's offices here in Zenton, there's lots of new developments. And the average vacancies for new developments are about 50%. Mm -hmm. So it means there's lots of choice in the office market. Mm -hmm. So there we go, stay away potentially from, from uh, too much office exposure. Mm -hmm. Let's look at uh, buying a hardcore property right now, that asset, uh, getting into it. Of course, uh, I suppose the adage buy low, sell high also uh, works when, you, when you're talking about actually buying property. Uh, is this the right time to be buying? I think it is, yes. Um, if you look at the uh, journey properties taken over the last probably five years, I mean, we went through the, the boom of 2003. 2006, seven um, people were buying properties and the gearing was phenomenal. You had uh, banks who would lend you 100% uh, of the money, uh, plus your transfer duty uh, and any other ancillary costs. So it was very easy to get in. And obviously since uh, the recession, we've, we've moved into a, a much more tricky market where I think the South African buying public has had to learn uh, a different route um, so you have to have your own equity. A deposit is a necessity. And um, I see this as a good thing. It's, you need to have a vested interest in your property. Mm -hmm. So to answer the question, is now a good time? I think yes, it is. We've been through uh, a correction phase where prices have dropped. Um, I'm not saying there are bargains out there, but there is a greater access to better priced properties. Mm -hmm. And again, it depends on what sort of property you're, you're purchasing. Um, you've still got your acquisition costs, your transfer duties to consider. So my advice to anybody considering that market would be to take your time, do your homework, look very carefully at your future growth and the prospects in that property. Mm. Uh, maybe a question I want to throw out then. It's, uh, I, I try and work out, because uh, we were just chatting a little bit off air about the cost of financing and mm. the concern around interest rates that are coming up. And, and I guess it applies to both, both mm -hmm. investment formats. But if you just start with residential property at the moment, I, I was at this development on Sunday and I noticed guys are quite happy to go and uh, uh, approach it with a buy to let perspective mm. but everybody there is putting down a minimum deposit interest rates are low at the moment what happens if interest rates start rising what's the impact on residential property mm. well it, it has an immediate effect um, particularly and we saw it in in days gone by where investors would pick up three or four units mm. or three or four properties they were quite heavily geared and it's absolutely fine when interest rates are low but once they start to move upwards, oh. you obviously get put under pressure as an investor. And uh, in some cases, you, you get forced into actually offloading those investments. How quickly does a retail property feel that, though? I mean, as a retail investor, I mean, because you, you, if... It depends, I suppose, how much debt you have. Sure, but I mean, if your interest rate has moved, how mm. quickly do you start seeing it in the market? If, if 1%, when, do you, when does, some, does it take six months for that to start coming through? It's, it's almost immediate. It depends also on the investor. There's, mm. there's some investors who have access to other funding um, and perhaps have a, a hedge or a buffer against that sort of uh, movement. Mm. Others who really are stretching their limits initially would feel it... Uh, almost uh, instantly. And then if we move it back to the listed property, I mean, the way I understand it, often listed property tends to preempt these moves mm. in terms of, uh, you know, the, 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 prop the sector comes under pressure the moment there's expectation that interest rates sure. are going to rise. Sure. So how does it, let's assume that, let's say 2014 interest rates are up by 1%, mm. or, you know, let's pick a number, let's yeah. say 1%, what's the impact on listed property in South Africa? So we've, we've seen that happen uh, recently in May and June mm. when we've seen uh, bond yields move up, like the 10-year bond yep. yield, 
from about 6% to close to 8%. Mm. Mm. Over that period, we saw listed property lose 19% uh, in uh, capital values. So the market reacts more to the bond market yep. rather than the interest rates. So the bond market preempts that, as you're saying mm. that. And the relationship with the bond market is about 80%. Uh, okay. So you have to watch out for, for the Does bond that market. necessarily mean that the underlying companies right now are coming under pressure almost immediately as you see South African government bonds sure. trading at uh, lower values? I sure. mean, uh, you know, the underlying value in terms of the properties, are they still healthy? Uh, did that 20% or 90% uh, loss in value, was that warranted? No. <laughs> so yeah. actually, what you find is actually the market just prices that short term pricing mm. versus bond market. So um, prices have changed, but the fundamentals haven't changed <coughs> at all. Actually, income growth assumptions are still the same. Our vacancies haven't changed materially. So we're still comfortable with the fundamental outlook of the listed uh, property market. Mm -hmm. So just short-term kind of pricing versus bond market. Whereas long-term, we're, we're actually pricing in higher bond yields mm -hmm. uh, as a house. And we're looking at total returns around about 11, 12% over mm -hmm. four years. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the last f 10 years, property achieved 25 26 percent annualized uh, returns. Mm -hmm. sure. One thing that worries me is cost and the cost of property and, and there I'm specifically referring to electricity and mm -hmm. rates and again it's probably a question that you both have some kind sure. of uh, view on but I mean, if I throw it maybe from the residential property perspective first reality is rates are rising probably double digit. Mm. Um, there, there are electricity costs, there are, there is water infrastructure is failing, it, it, it's becoming very, very expensive to run a, an ordinary household, let mm. alone multiple investment properties. Mm. Where do you guys, how, what impact do you think that's going to have on prices in the, in, in the next two to three years? I think it's going to put uh, pressure on prices and um, obviously it's a concern to any investor besides the fact that you've got your acquisition costs transfer duty, mm. you've also got your disposal costs, you need to pay an agency unless you sell it privately. So all of those factors need to be taken into account when you look at your return on investment. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, uh, it would be a lot better if they were coming down, put it that way. You talked about right-sizing uh, the size of your mortgage. And interesting mm -hmm. that your boss, Andrew Golding, basically saying that uh, you shouldn't have a mortgage more than 50% because you have to, you have to keep uh, you know, check of all the costs that go into maintaining a property, uh, you know, geezer bursts, garage doors need replacement, whatever they, whatever they may be, and of course there are cost escalations. So um, when it comes to, to mortgages right now, I mean, do you see that uh, property owners are looking for those a smaller mortgage or people are still looking for max amount of debt? I think um, we're in a, a, a phase of change. So there's the historical culture of uh, maximizing the amount you can borrow from an institution versus a new culture where um, people are realizing that you do have to have a certain amount of liquidity. And like I said earlier, I think it's a very good idea to have some of your own money invested in the property. It, um, it creates a responsibility to, to that investment. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the past, you could hand your keys in at the bank and go off to Australia. Um, now you can't. You've actually got to step up to the plate and um, control your... But I mean, that's my, that's my argument for going for listed property as it, I mean, a lot of people don't have the cash resources to be able to put down 50% deposit. Mm -hmm. The cost of financing most, most second properties is too high. Mm -hmm. So yes, you don't you lose out on the gearing, but you get you get real growth and you get income from it immediately, sure. and you get liquidity. Does the I mean, do, do you buy that argument from you know if, if 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 somebody said to you here's a residential property, second property, take it or leave it, versus listed property? I mean, where do you stand on it? Let's talk about accessibility. It's easy to access listed property. Mm. On average, unit trust in debit orders of five hundred rand per month, or like five thousand rand uh, lump sum. Yeah. And the most important <coughs> thing is, uh, is liquidity, is exit point. Mm. It's easy to exit. Uh, within a week, you've got your cash. Obviously, you're losing out on caring, but you are getting stable and, and growing income. But then again, I mean, okay, that's the, you know, that's the argument. You can't live in your listed property, and of course, you can't benefit from it in that way. And that, of course, is uh, where the whole argument for actually owning property as opposed to paying rent mm. comes in. Um, so what's the, what's the thought process right now? What trends are you seeing when it comes to people deciding whether to own or rent? Well, there are a couple of um, scenarios unfolding. With interest rates coming down, people have greater access to um, finance. So 
we did see a move where people started to purchase their own properties. You, you, you know, in, in higher inflationary uh, scenarios, it becomes very costly. So people opted, or well, sometimes were forced to opt for the rental option. But now that interest rates have come down, they can actually afford uh, bonds. So we're seeing the lower end respond in that way. Mm -hmm. And oddly enough, and quite interestingly, the top end um, has responded well as, as well. So we might be seeing the first signs of a recovery, at least I'm hoping. Um, so people are right now taking on a little bit more debt, more appetite for debt, even though we're talking about, from a macro perspective, concerns around the slowdown in the economy. I think it's linked to, s to sentiment. And you know, if interest rates, I remember when interest rates went from 25% to 23%, everybody rushed out and bought property. They're now sitting incredibly low in relation to that. And there's a sentiment that it's as low as it'll probably go, but there's a positivity on the horizon. Mm -hmm. sure. mm -hmm. me, I'll, I'll throw one to you. Do you believe the house you live in is an asset? Yeah, I do, but I rent it. Sure. And I wish I owned it. But why? Uh, you, but you see, if you did this times, I, I pretty much guarantee you'll find out that it's not an asset. And it's the argument I have mm -hmm. often. While I get the idea that the house you, you benefit from living in, and the cost of running a house in South Africa is high. Mm -hmm. it, the, 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 I mean, you, the FMB surveys, pick one, any of these home price surveys, they show that, the pro that we're not have, we don't have the steep growth curve anymore in terms of how quickly property is going. And the, the, resident, the house you live in, once you've added in inflation and the maintenance costs and the financing costs over your 20 years, it very quickly becomes, it's, it's not an asset, it but becomes a liability. What's the, what's the difference though between sectional title and freehold? Because if you are talking about costs, mm -hmm. uh, those costs can be taken away if you, you know, don't have to look, for the, look at the upkeep of the swimming pool and the complex, mm. painting, uh, etc., cetera, and, and security as well. Sure, I mean, there I agree with you. So, uh, and I think that, I mean, John, Jonathan's probably got insight to it as well. But the idea that it's a, you know, trying to maintain these properties, you know, you've got, you still got the risk of the body corporate. I mean, if you, you are as, as weak as the weakest person is in within the body corporate. Yeah. And that, you know, that would worry me. That would be something I would worry about because then you're kind of looking at the guy next to you and saying, is he actually pulling his weight? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, you do need a good, well-managed body corporate. Mm -hmm. So is there still money to be made by buying property right now? I mean, if you are looking to buy an actual property, where, sh where should you be buying? I would look at a couple of sectors. I'd first of all look for something which is secure and something where your, your maintenance isn't too high. You could buy a rambling acre property, but you've then got the upkeep of maintenance, cutting the lawns, those sorts of things. So what your typical investor will go for is something that exists in a complex, like you mentioned earlier, sectional title, where there's a levy which contributes to a, uh, a, all of those services, the lawns, all of those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But, um, <coughs> excuse me, from an area point of view, Look at Melrose Arch. There's a fantastic opportunity in Melrose Arch. Um, the inner CBD, which I think has been forgotten for many years, is alive and thriving. There are, there's a, a huge amount of uh, renovation, new buildings being converted into... But it's been alive and <coughs> thriving for some time now, hasn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely. Or is it more so than it has in the past? More so than it has in the past. I think the perception of, of the CBD has always been it's the CBD. But uh, my advice would be to drive into C the CBD, have a look around. There's a lot going on. There's some very good investments. Um, and it's becoming a very, very interesting um, melting pot. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Keelan, tell us about how we should invest in the listed property space, because that's what Mark is leaning towards and buys <laughs> with. So, so where, where's the opportunity right now? Which are the uh, top stocks there? Uh, in the retail space, we like um, higher property investments. The only big and dominant retail like Canal Walk, uh, the Glen, and in the office space, uh, I'll we'll go for Sycom Property mm -hmm. Fund. In but you don't, you don't like office space though, because yeah. of the fact that there's so many vacancies. That's right, yeah, but relatively speaking, it's probably bigger corporate tenanted offices is a lot mm -hmm. better. And then better quality uh, assets, uh, right, yes. tenants rather. Yes, and then non-metropolitan retail will love uh, companies like Resilient and Fortress, they dominate that space, they're in the low income to middle income areas and uh, those markets work quite well. Yeah, I mean, one of the questions I have, though, I mean, there's a lot of new property listings That's coming right. to the market. Should, we, should that be something we, worry, we should be worried about? Because it almost gets the same, you know, every time you see a sector booming, there's, mm -hmm. there's invariably things and bust that comes after it. That's right. But I mean, if you look at the portfolios, as a, as a layman, you look at the portfolios, you think they look all right, they're cash generated, then none of them are hugely indebted from what I can, you know, from the ones that you can, from what you can yes. see. 
Um, should we be worried about all these new listings that are coming in? N not really, actually. We look at, uh, we select the companies mm. and giving us uh, more choice, uh, size, and liquidity for the sector. The sector has been growing mm. over the last uh, two to three years. So welcome new listings, provided they offer the good quality, good management as well, and they diversify uh, the sector. And but we're selective on that. Now, a lot of the property companies are being reclassified as yes. REITs. Yes. Tell us about that and why it's favorable, and is it favorable to shareholders? Sure, it is. Um, so in simple terms, um, REITs, uh, which is a REIT uh, Real Estate Investment Trust, uh, it's a global property legislation. So what it does is just eliminates uh, tax completely uh, from the books of these property companies. So there's no deferred tax, uh, there's no mm. capital gains tax. So you're getting a nice, clean structure that uh, investors un understand. Mm. And actually enhances actually deals and mergers and acquisitions. The foreign company is holding back, but now it's a lot better. And we're the eighth largest REIT market in the world. Um, so the foreigners, if they look to diversify, South Africa comes as a good choice as well. There we go. Well, sure. we'll leave it at that for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Some ideas if you're hoping to become a property mogul. And of course, if you are one already, well, there we go. Congratulations to you, Keelan and Glovu, Head of Property Funds at Stanup. Jonathan Davies, Joint Area Manager for Pam Golding Properties. It's time now to take a look at the Finweek Trade of the Week. Well, this week's trade of the week is Afrocentric. Uh, tell us why it's caught your eye. Yeah, I mean, look, I've been punting it for a while now, and then it got to four bucks oh. this year, or four, four and ten. I thought it was quite interesting. There, obviously, they've got a high power board behind them. For those, for for those who don't know the company, it's essentially an investment holding company. It's got some big names on the board, including Mayor Khan, Brian Joffe, etc. Their primary assets are Med Scheme, and they've got a 27% st stake in Jasco. Uh, which one of the technology groups. I mean, the reason I like it at the moment, you've got a business that trading on a PE of six. Yes, it's an investment holding company, so it does deserve to trade at a, at a, at a bit of a discount. Um, dividend of 2.8%. Um, Jesco's re realigning itself. It looks like you know they've they've sold their head office, so they will you know it should come through to the balance sheet quite quickly when, once that cash comes through. And then there's essentially when the um, healthcare legislation changes and we see the government uh, government policies coming through, you can expect something like Med Scheme to be right up there because of its high levels of, of, of um, BE shareholding in it. Mm -hmm. And Afrocentric seems to give you quite a discounted entry point. At the moment, it's three three rand eighty today. I mean, that was lower than what I was looking at for a couple of weeks ago. So I mean, I think for me, it's nice value. There you go. How how risky is it? High risk, low risk, medium. risk? Risk, how risky Look, they're sitting with 208 million in cash in the bank. They're cash positive. They they can do things. They got a nice board. It's it's one of those things which I think is just going to you've got to wait until it matures. It's a good business, mm -hmm. um, and they've got nice assets. And I think that you know you're not totally concentrated on a single thing, a and you get the predictability of, of, of a typical medical administrator. Mm -hmm. So there is regular, you know, it's a cash generative business. So I, mean, I can't see too much risk in it in the near term. And of course, as you said, it's looking cheap at the moment. Well, it's time now for a short ad break. We'll see you straight after this. Welcome back. You're watching Finweek Money Matters. Now, black South African investors have some unique opportunities that to buy shares in blue chip listed companies at a discount to ordinary shares. However, complicated structures, high levels of debt and limited opportunities to trade the shares have meant that uh, many have steered clear of BE shares. So we take a look at what opportunities are out there. In studio with me, Craig Gradage, financial advisor at Gradage Mahura Investments and Anthony Wilmot from Singular Systems. Anthony, I'll throw straight to you. Just tell us what are the options right now when we're talking about listed BE shares? I'm only aware of one specific listed BE mm. share that is on the JC's BE board, and that's the Sassel and Zalo share, which has, trades under the, the, the counter code of Sol BE1, uh, and that is available on the JSC. Um, and the requirements in terms of maintaining your BE ness is done through stockbrokers. So they enforce the rules that only black investors can buy those shares. And all others OTC traded? At the moment, all the others are OTC traded, the publicly traded ones. There mm -hmm. are quite a few that are still not traded. 
So they're still in a locked up period where the investors were given, bought the shares, but they have not yet been traded. Mm -hmm. Maybe just give us some insight into, you know, which has volume in these shares picked up, either mm -hmm. on the listed or the OTC market, just in terms of, is there awareness of the, of the opportunities to actually trade these shares? Because you've got, in this, you've got in, I was under the impression that a lot of these people interested in them, but then the, the sort of debt came through, and, 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 and people weren't overly interested in actually trading the BEE shares. Do, has that sentiment toward them changed? You, you're absolutely right, and that was probably in the early days of the decisions of what to do. Mm. Um, Sassel was the very first one to go into the JCS BEE board and it wasn't very well traded. Mm. Uh, and probably the reason for that was not the function to do anything with the JSE. The fact that you had 40 different stockbrokers assisting these people to sell the shares, and most of these shareholders had never owned shares before mm. and had no concept of how to deal with stockbrokers. We saw the opportunity a, as our company to go to the next series of people that were going to bring these shares to the market and say to them, listen, chaps, Potentially the way to, to address this problem of lack of liquidity is to make it easier. Mm -hmm. So essentially what we did for them is we wrote software to provide the trading platforms and manage the whole scheme end to end on their behalf. Mm -hmm. So one needs to be very careful as to what is happening here. Um, these are effectively OTC shares that are traded. Um, it's not an exchange. It's one company's shares that are traded and those shares are traded between each shell.